Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 878. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 3rd, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. This is where Kevin and George sit down and talk about all the things we know and some things we don't know. Okay, clearly there's topics we have no idea about, uh, but most of the topics we're experts on, especially when it comes to Anglican news. How are you doing this week, George? I'm tired. Uh, It's been a busy, busy time. Um, I've been... uh, well, uh, one of the things we're having to decide as a congregation is we've been pl- we've been wanting to plant a sister congregation in the town of Homosassa, which is about a half hour drive south, about 15, 16 miles. And just this, this past week, the chaplain at our local state prison, Sumter Correctional Institute, has asked me, would I plant a congregation at the prison? And I'm getting old. Uh, I'm fat and I get tired. Now, am I able to plant a mission congregation and a prison chaplaincy? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Kevin, as you say, I'm one of these people that I, I cannot say no. My children learned this a long, long time ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and people have figured this out about me. No, it's true. Uh, one of the things you, you, you don't... My wife suffered... It's called can't say no itis okay Mm -hmm. and my wife has it she you know when she's at church she's instantly volunteered for six different things oh i can do altar guild i can i'll do coffee morning you know and stuff like that and meanwhile kevin and i've served as a senior warden for like 25 years straight at a church 22 years straight i have now learned to say no kevin we like to consider (laughs) you for no you don't want to consider me for nothing. <laughs> it's like, no, I can't do it anymore. I lost my hair. I went gray. I got fat. No, can't do it. So, George, I, I know you you have the same thing. And uh, it's cute because uh, every other week, George and I get on camera here. And he tells me how much money he just gave his daughters just because they asked. You know, Daddy, my car broke. <laughs> I need a couple million dollars. Okay. <laughs> can't say no. <laughs> But that, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you have a wonderful family. I have a wonderful family. Um, yeah, I mean, church planting is the desire of uh, every church is to uh, be, to plant. I mean, I go to, a long time ago, uh, it was you know, a church plant of a church somewhere else, uh, the, the Christ Church of uh, Akuki. Um, I didn't say that right, whatever. And uh, so, you know, church planting is the way it goes. And, to, yeah, and the they, uh, to plant a church in a prison is amazing. Yeah, I uh, every so often, it's a small county I live in, and and uh, every so often the county commissioners have me on their ro- ro- rota to give the invocation at the county commission's meeting. And I went to one, I did one last month, I think it was. And on the topic with the agenda was the growth planning we now have a highway connecting to our county. We didn't before. So to get here in the past, you couldn't get here. Uh, but the, one of the things the county commissioners said that they have platted out uh, 65,000 lots that are now vacant. And even with 65,000 lots, that would still leave three quarters of the county forested or swamps yeah. or lakes. Swamped. So that uh, conceivably, we could have 65,000 uh, single family homes and be a commuter suburb of Orlando and Tampa. Mm-hmm. Um, if if all the projections, you know, go the way the county boosters want it to go. Um, just, and now I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, your town. 65,000 uh, <laughs> new parishioners, what am I yeah, gonna do? It, your town just got its first Panera bread. And so you know yes. you, you're starting to become and a, a target a metropolitan, you know. Oh, get boy, a target. No, no, would, no it, would, they just there's a cow pasture that's no longer a cow pasture. It's a target. It's Panera Bread. It's a Starbucks, 
and an Aldi's supermarket. I've never been to Aldi, so I don't know. If no. Yeah, it's yeah. generic but, grocery. But actually, Chick Chick Fil A turned us down because we're too small. Okay, <laughs> Jeez. that'll change pretty quickly. All right, let's move on to the news. Um, I, I, let me just say it right now: uh, if you don't like the show, please like the show. Uh, you guys have been really gracious in that. We got lots of likes, lots of comments. Uh, we're well over ten thousand subscribers. Um, I think we, we hit a, a point where YouTube is finally promoting the show. Um, and we talked about the Roman Catholic Church three weeks in a row. That that helped a little bit. But thanks, guys. It's been a, a great couple of weeks for the show, and the numbers have shown it. And your participation in the comments have been wonderful. Let's move on to the news. More troubles in Rome, you tell me, George. Uh, the Pope is still stirring up controversy because he is become an anti-ritualist, whatever that means. Well, the Pope has become an Episcopalian for all intents and purposes. Um, I know some people have had, don't like Francis for the things he says or does, but in an odd, you know, Greg Venables, former primate of South America, Bishop of Argentina, mm -hmm. when Francis was elected, said, you know, told us, told you in an interview, he, he really liked Francis. He was, mm -hmm. he and Francis were on the same wavelengths. Yeah. And Greg is an evangelical Anglican and is a pretty good judge of character. Uh, now, one of the things that Francis has come out with is all these reforms that he's pushing forward. And in his last, you know, we spoke about uh, Mar using Marian language that is amenable to the Protestant world. His remarks about Mary are, we as an Episcopalian or an evangelical and say, yeah, I buy that. Yeah, sister. Now for traditionists from a, yeah. For a traditionist Roman Catholic, it falls way short, but nonetheless. Now, this past week, we had an Angelus where Francis condemns ritualism and that, that there are portions of the Catholic Church that worship man-made rules and customs and traditions over the Holy Spirit. Now, insiders say this is an attack against the traditional Latin Mass people, but if you're an Anglican or an Evangelical, or if you're a man named uh, if you, Martin Luther or somebody, you're yeah. thinking, yay, hey, Francis, to the who got it? Yeah, hooray. <laughs> uh -huh. so, so, okay, that was then. So whether it is a purely local attack on the traditional Latin Mass or Francis is saying, you know, some of these criticisms waged to get uh, leveled against the Catholic way of doing church by Protestant groups, there has, is some merit to them. Well, being one of a, those Protestants who level criticisms, I hear Francis's words as also as being confirmations of some of my criticisms. Now, yeah, if you're but, traditional, I don't think you want that, do you? You don't want me to be given ammunition by Francis. No, but it was not Pachamama uh, ritual? I mean, I think back to some of the things he's attended, uh, in the last 10 years, and I'm thinking, that looked a little ritualistic. Uh, Am I wrong? I, I, well, I, I mean, this is this is a continued attack, obviously, against the Latin Mass. He, uh, The Latin Mass is something that's been on his uh, to-do uh, box since day one. And he's, he's checked it off, and throughout Roman Catholicism, it is very difficult now to practice a Latin Mass. Yeah, but you know, here's the thing: these it may be you may be entirely hundred percent correct, Kevin. But in forty or fifty years, people will read this and they'll forget about the Latin Mass controversy, and it'll be applied to sort of the deeper picture of the, you know, role of tradition versus the role of the New Testament and this and that in determining church life, doctrine, and rituals. So, Francis. If he is trying to pursue short-term tactical uh, gains against his opponents within the Catholic Church, is giving strategic advantage to those who oppose the traditional Catholic way of doing things. People like Protestants like me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I can think back in my lifetime uh, of other popes. Pope John the Twenty-Third. Uh, 
who would say and you must have been a very very bright baby because i don't even know <laughs> you don't remember that you probably were a gleam in his parents oh, eyes. Just, oh come on hey and so pope john uh uh the 23rd was considered a liberal in his time he was considered you know this guy who was going after to the tradition and wanted to have reforms and he he started the vatican too if i remember correctly you know so you know, Pope Francis is not the first, and probably won't be the last, but he's going to be judged by his generation, and it's it's interesting to see all that. Let's move on to the next news well, item here. Well, <laughs> act, no, actually, there's a lot of little things here. Let me just finish it out for you. Okay. Then. Okay. One of the one of the one of the things that uh, traditionalist Catholics like to fling at uh, Episcopalians and Lutherans and whatnot is that you're not a real church. In fact, we don't even call you a church. We call you an ecclesial community. Mm -hmm. We don't, because there is only one church, the one which is the true church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. We found that in our comments well, last week, in the comment section. Yeah. Yes. Well, here's the problem with that. The dicastery on promoting Christian unity has dropped all that. What are you talking about, George? Well, uh, the uh, dicastery's re most recent documents no longer call the Episcopal Church, the Anglicans, an ecclesial community, they call them churches. And where is this coming from? Well, the German Bishops' Conference is pushing this the hardest. And they have a New Testament professor among their ranks, Michael Theobald, who's Professor Tubigen, who's basically put out uh, from a, he's at, on the faculty of the Catholic Theology faculty at Tubigen, saying that the New Testament does contemplate a consensus majority rule church where lay people have a role in de deciding doctrine and discipline. And that the primacy of the Pope is not one of authority, but in relation to other churches, used to be called ecclesial communities, yeah. he is a mediator. He is the first among equals. He's almost an Archbishop of Canterbury type. He has primacy of honor, and he is, you know, he is the successor to Peter. But to be in communion with him, you do not have to submit to him. This is what's coming out of the Germans. This is what's coming out of the con uh, the castry on promoting Christian unity. These sorts of thinking, which. For an Anglican, gee, that's wonderful, Francis. You're basically uh, surrendering on our terms. Uh, but for traditional Catholics, this is an abomination because it's un upending the, the teaching that the only true church is our church. Mm -hmm. And now the Vatican bureaucrats are saying, well, not quite. George's church, for all its warts and failings, and Kevin's church, are true churches which we knew and then the last okay, we knew that mm -hmm. i mean yeah, but uh, you know t taking a step back my earliest you know teaching uh, of anglicanism is kevin we recognize the pope as the bishop of rome we don't recognize mm -hmm. papal authorities or papal dogma but we do recognize that he is the bishop of rome and th that's a common understanding in anglicanism now, to th how things have so gone so far in my lifetime, when I was a little boy, I had a nanny named Peggy. Peggy uh, took care of uh, me and my brothers. And uh, I would, one of the things she would, she, Peggy, as my mother would say, was just off the boat from Ireland. She mm -hmm. came from Cork. She was an Irish immigrant. And she was Roman Catholic, very Roman Catholic. And she would take me to choir practice and to, well, he would, she would drive me to church and stuff but she would never set foot in the church. She would always sit outside under the, uh, in the vestibule, the little arch outside. And I once said to Peggy, cause it was raining, Peggy, why don't you come inside? She said, oh, Georgie, 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 if I set foot in a, Catholic, in, a in a Protestant church, the floor would open up and Satan himself would drag me down to hell. And she meant this. Yeah. I mean, she, it really was a threat to her salvation to step foot in an Episcopal church. Compare that today with what the Catholic professor of the New Testament at Tubigen is saying that uh, about the Pope is first among equals. 
that uh, decision that the decisions of the church life, the laity play as an important part, as an important role, as do the clergy. Man, where have we gone? Yeah. Yeah. Things are changing. And, and, yeah. and we don't need to go into this in detail because our friend Gavin Ashenden has a whole show on this. But the Vatican bureaucrats have now dropped AD and BC in favor of CE and BCE before okay. the common era and the common era. We need to explain this because not everybody in our show is a historian. Why did they change it, George? What, why did society change it, first of all? Well, academia changed it about 20 years ago for political correctness. We did yes. because AD, Anno Domine, before the birth of Jesus Christ, and uh, after, you know, Anno, after his birth and BC before Christ, mm -hmm. um, were overtly Christian designations for the naming of time of our calendar. And in the, the secular academic world wanted to change this. You know, one of the things that when people come into power who really want to change the world do is change the calendar. In the French Revolution, they changed the calendar. Yeah, Cambodian Revolution, it was year one. Um, there's, of course, there's a Muslim calendar, a Jewish calendar, a Hindu calendar, but the world has been using the Christian calendar you know, for centuries due, due to the position of the West of being at the, at the top dog. Well, the secularists have wanted to remove the Christian language before Christ and Anno Domini and replace it with non-religious uh, language. So before Christ becomes before the common era and AD is replaced by the common era. So in essence, they're taking Christ, it's like the, you know, the things we see every December, taking Christ out of Christmas, uh, <laughs> making it a secular shopping holiday rather than a religious festival. Well, it's, it's changing the campus crusade for Christ to crew. Okay. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's renaming the thing, but you can't avoid the event. The event is still the singularity of the calendar. And uh, mm -hmm. it's the, 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 the defining moment of the calendar is still uh, the birth of Christ. So, yeah. Yeah, I well, it's it all, all part want. of this. Yeah. It's all the part of the death of common sense language where we can't, you know, mm. boys and girls or not boys and girls or, or, oh, there was some government thing I saw that, you know, women are not called women anymore, but uh, persons with, uh, with uteruses or something, you know, just really get weird stuff here in this politically correct language. Mm. Well, let's move on and talk about. Uh, the 1,400 uh, Israelis who were killed October 7th, we've now extended that. Uh, more, hostage have, have, more hostages have been killed. Uh, Hamas, the ter terrorist organization, have gunned down six hostages the other day. And uh, you and I look for the, the Twitterverse to see who's going to respond to that. Will the Pope say something? Will uh, Justin Welby say something? Not with a lot of hope that he'll say something, but... My golly, Justin Welby uh, tweeted about the hostages. Yeah, Kevin, you know, for our regular viewers, they're going to fall out of their chairs. I'm praising Justin Welby. He got it right. Uh, as soon as he heard the news, he tweeted a uh, very strong post denouncing the violence, denouncing their murder. He called it murder. Um, Francis had a... Usually Francis and Welby uh, have a weenie contest when these world events happen. Who can have the most anodyne, uninspiring statement that, you know, shows that they made the effort, but it's not a very strong one. Usually Welby wins the weenie contest. It's um, not a contest. But, <laughs> but you know, this, this week Francis uh, in the Vatican put out, you know, Francis and his comments from the Vatican Square condemned violence in Gaza. He didn't go into the murder business, whereas Justin Welby denounced the murder. But he didn't name the murderer. I mean, it's Justin It's still Wel a passing uh, grade, Kevin. It, it's I mean, a passing, he, he's getting a B uh, on a paper. He could have got an A just by putting the word Hamas in there. And I get it, you know, um, but in this world, putting... Uh, the identity of the uh, victim and the identity of the perpetrator is important. You know, we need to know who the enemy is. 
and here it's a terrorist organization who uh, killed uh, 1,400 people October 7th, and they're continuing their slaughter um, now. So, oh boy. But actually, this followed a week where Francis has been roasted by yeah. by, by first it started with the chief rabbi of South Africa, who's a very very good polemical writer. He took Francis and Welby to task for abandoning Christians in Europe uh, to Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism. And uh, Melanie Phillips, uh, an, you know, an op opinion writer, had a really s savage takedown. And a lot of people picked up this, uh, this South African uh, piece and just hammered Welby for being a weenie. And Good for France. Good for Justin Welby, for not letting this detract from what the right thing to do. Uh, he, he could have just pulled in his horns, you know, not want to talk about anything that would get him in trouble. But instead, he did the right thing. So I praise Justin Welby's, frankly, political courage. Sure. Uh, it's courage for doing something that I haven't seen a lot of other Church of England bishops talk about. Done. So we do appreciate it, and I, I get it, and these are hard political times, and we're, we're glad he said something. Uh, let's bring up uh, Enoch Burke. We've talked about him now for about two and a half years. He was the uh, I, I, Irish teacher who was uh, let go because he would not conform his grammar and language to the, the queer community in Ireland. And... Uh, uh, when I say let go, he was not fired. He's still paid by the school, but he's ended up in jail uh, for contempt of court and other things. And there's two stories here. Okay, and we're going to try and handle them as best as Anglican uh, TV can. Is Enoch Burke a victim? Absolutely. Is Enoch Burke perpetrating a little bit of this? A little bit. A little, you know, a little bit. So let, let's talk about the story, George. Okay. Enoch Burke uh, was a humanities teacher, I think English or history or something. English, I think. At yeah. Christ's, Hospitals, Christ's Hospital School, which is a Church of Ireland school. Burke was asked by the headmaster to follow the desires of a student who a boy who was thinking it was a girl or a girl thought it was a boy, some transgender stuff. And Burke said, no, he wouldn't do that. He would not uh, betray his principles, which he, which he based upon his reading of the Bible and lie to the child and conform to political correctness. Well, Burke was suspended from by the headmaster. Well, Burke continued to show up for work because he rejected the suspension and he was, this led to the uh, school getting a, a court order forbidding him from coming to the school, which Burke refused to honor. And he's been jailed twice now. And just with the start of the school year, Burke went back to the school to protest it and was now jailed a third time. And the thing is, Burke points out, he's still being paid by the school. He has uh, not been fired. It's not like he's a stranger, but he is having a dispute with the leaders of the school over freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. And uh, an employment tribunal is still looking at his claims of unfair suspension and potential dismissal. And this whole Enoch Burke thing is sort of causing a bit of a stir in Ireland. Some people think he's a publicity hound or basically is seeking martyrdom. Well, other people say, you know, and they're looking at Ireland falling apart with mm -hmm. the importation of migrants and the super political correct language of the government and the media and saying, good for Enoch Burke. He's, he is basically, People sort of saying, if I had the courage to do what he's doing, I would do it, but I don't. But thank God for Enoch Burke being a paragon of virtue. Earlier this year, his family, while he was in prison, he spent over 400 days in jail so far for refusing to abide by court orders. Uh, his family interrupted the Church of Ireland General Synod, and it was quite amusing to watch because the Church of Ireland, tr true to its weenie nature, 
uh, has neither is neither hot nor cold on this, even though it's a Church of Ireland school, um, and the primate primus uh, primate of Church of Ireland, Archbishop of Armagh, was sort of caught with his mouth hanging open while the uh, protests were going on. Uh, it's quite amusing, but uh, well, Kevin, I don't know if this guy is just a zealot who's looking to be persecuted. You know, some people enjoy persecution. They, or they is do. he truly but a man of conscience? Looking at Ireland, Ireland, uh, is, as far as Europe has gone, is left as you can go. Um, they proposed the uh, anti-hate law. This new anti-hate law that's been proposed and it's being discussed says if I offend somebody, I could be arrested for a hate crime. Now, that's... Now, when you say Go ahead. When you say as left as you can go, that means if you look in the map, that's as far left. Far left. No, well, it's an island. What do you want? And so, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, as liberal, ultra liberal, can go. They they have proposed laws uh, that would um, make speech a hate crime. So that if I went to a party and I offended somebody for whatever reason I do, and I I'm an offensive person, I get that. Um, I could be t uh, brought up on charges of a hate crime. Uh, for putting now not just a uh, queer community, not just, uh, you know, whatever the topic of the day is, but the language says to offend somebody it is going to be illegal. And that's that's a stretch of, of speech, you know, that goes back in time. Now, in America, we understand free speech completely different than most countries. Uh, and Europe does not have the freedom of speech. Uh, England or the UK does not have the freedom of speech the way that we understand it. Uh, but what they're proposing in Ireland goes even, you know, 10 steps further. So is, mm -hmm. you know, an Enoch Burke character, uh, someone who could put a stop gap to that because of the way he's being treated? Or is he seeking publicity? Yeah, you know, it's hard to tell. I know his family is very good at uh, keeping him in the headlines. Well, if the criticisms being leveled at Enoch Burke are the criticisms that were le uh, leveled against what we call freedom riders during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, black and white activists who would go out of their way to get, at, get arrested uh, by to protest what they saw as unjust laws or regulations so that um, uh, the civil rights heroes would court arrest and would seek to be arrested to highlight what they saw as the injustice. Now, they at that time were called outside agitators trying mm -hmm. just to get publicity and whatnot. And so it's just fascinating to see the same language being used by arch conservatives in the 60s and 50s are now being used against uh, civil rights workers, are now being used by liberals against a religious uh, fella. Yeah. All right. Our next two stories are about the how the church war of the last 20 years are largely over. Uh, Uganda recently had its... Uh, uh, oh, I lost my show notes one second here. Uganda had its general synod. And you know what, what was not mentioned, George? Not one itty-bitty iota, GAFCON, ACNA, nobody talked about tech, nobody talked about uh, Justin Welby. It was just a regular general synod where we talk about Uganda. Yeah, it was the 27th or 29th General Synod, and there may have been discussion here or there, but as to the official resolutions, whole slew of them, you can see them on Anglican Inc. Uh, no international. The uh, Nothing about Welby, nothing about the Episcopal Church, and, you know, Kevin, you and I have been doing this for so long that the a regular staple of these African Church synods were denunciations Mm -hmm. of the things that were going on. Yeah. So we don't have any denunciations from Uganda's synod about the recent uh, uh, Church of England's uh, living in love and faith stuff. The archbishop's already spoken on that. And for them, basically, you know, we got we got to get back to life. And the English have chosen the course they're going to take. One thing that some of our viewers might find either exciting or horrible is that the Church of Uganda has officially formed a women's clergy network and to celebrate and empower women clergy, 
of whom there are now over 400 women priests in Uganda. And they are really going all out in support of women clergy. They're not going to have women bishops yet because of the moratorium that the GAFCON churches have asked its members to hold. But should that be lifted, Uganda will have oh, a woman bishop pretty darn quickly. Mm -hmm. And Sudan already has one or two, so mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Sudan has one, Kenya has two, mm -hmm. Mozambique, uh, which is coming into the GAFCON fold, has one woman bishop, African bishop. She's Angolan. Well, there's an Angol. In other words, the uh, traditionalist women bishops are now not like unicorns, you know mythical things they're real they're real um and also south carolina has announced that it has purchased some shoreline property to uh set up camp george that's pretty incredible considering what's happening in the episcopal church oh uh, yeah the episcopal church we read that uh the diocese in indiana northern indiana indiana are talking about merging uh eastern and western michigan merged wisconsin your old stomping ground is now one diocese had been three yeah. we're seeing talks of consolidation we're seeing talks of new hampshire vermont and maine trying to come together to uh, cut costs uh bethlehem and uh central pennsylvania perhaps merging well uh the diocese of chicago has mothballed their camp the diocese of michigan has mothballed their camp your the trajectory of your comments are absolutely right google mm -hmm. just has the facts wrong but the right. majority of this the Diocese of Central Florida had Canterbury Conference Center and Camp Wingman. One is the conference center, and we've shut it down. Mm -hmm. And we're looking either to redevelop it or the suburbs of Orlando have now moved all around this. And and the thing was losing $40,000 a month uh, when uh, Bishop Holcomb took over, and he put a stop to that and made a decision that, you know, this can't go on. Yeah. Contrast that to Diocese of South Carolina, Anglican Diocese of South Carolina. Now that they're not having to throw money down a lawyer hole, they are able to use the growth and opportunities to buy, I think, 70 acres of uh, waterfront property to develop into a youth retreat and a conference camp. Uh, they're going to call it Camp Jubilee. Used to, add, you know, they, you no, know, you know, Chip Edgar made a smart decision at a certain, you know, we got to cut our losses and just go forward and not just keep throwing money and hoping that we can win Camp Christopher back after another round of appeals all the way up to the U.S. and the state Supreme Courts. At a certain point, people don't want to give to fund lawsuits. They want to give to fund summer camps when you have a thriving, alive, joyful uh, diocese. Yeah. So this, the ability, not only the financial ability, but the morale of the diocese that allows them to take that step forward. I don't think they had the whole wad of cash to pay out everything, but the diocese is confident that it can, you know, pay and develop this property and make it into a wonderful place. So Which it speaks opposite, well of the future. The opposite of, trajectory. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Opposite, they could, I mean, so yeah. many, so many of the Episcopal, you know, demography is destiny, people like to say, and, you know, my, parish is growing our diocese is stable but i think we're seeing signs of uptick with our new bishop and so all the collapse and the moaning and groaning the episcopal church nationally may have nothing to do with us yeah so whereas yeah, I, in michigan and in indiana wisconsin they're all having to suck it up and get you know tighten their belts small. consolidate yeah small is beautiful now i would recommend that south carolina consider part of that shoreline being rv uh resort of some sort but yeah do what you need to do keep me posted uh a fun news story to 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 talk about here so um has that we've covered all the church stories right looking through my yeah. notes here yep uh just you put just the uh, just the free church of england uh uh, follow up it's not in our show notes but uh follow up to that there's no new news i saw uh free church of england had posted on their facebook account that they're looking for priests and uh i sent you that link um remarkable uh 
I, let's let the, the audience know, if you're new here, August and September are slow months for news. You're not going to get a lot of hard-hitting uh, news in these two months. And so it's okay if you uh, skip 10 minutes of an episode in those two months. Not the whole episode. We need the, we need the numbers. But in as such, I'm not surprised that there's not a, a continued story right away in the Free Church of England, George. Well, the story is that more and more ex-Free Church of England clergy are coming out and going public with their treatment at the hands of Bishop John Fenwick, mm -hmm. which is spelled Fenwick, and we pronounce Fenwick in the United States, but evidently they pronounced Fenwick in England. That's fine. And and the uh, the either Bishop Fenwick has a genius for bringing into the Church, Free Church of England people who he later has to get rid of because they're horrible clergy, he says. Or Fennec is just a piece of work. I don't know how to say it without being uh, unkind. But this is just, you know, the, the personal testimonies of some of the clergy, you know, and some of them have said, oh, can I, you know, they're asking me to connect them with Kevin so they can talk about this on air yeah. after having had to suffer uh, in silence. And... It, as I said, there's no new news. Probably the next new news will be the uh, Synod in October of the Free Church of England Northern Diocese to see if they do anything about this bishop. Yeah. Or if the Reformed Episcopal Church puts out a statement, you know, under their bishop's name saying, you know, back off or be sweet or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know. Well, let's see what happens. Um, now, it's we're 37 minutes in. We run out of time to talk about church things, but we still got, you know, some filler time, George. And you wrote down here, number six, Brazil bans X Twitter for those who are not up to the latest news. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Twitter according to all the the new websites out there is the number one news source uh for news and uh mm -hmm. it, they replaced drudge report they replaced uh, new york times uh clearly the numbers are growing uh a lot i, I see a lot more uh, people on x and twitter now um and yet elon musk is still the enemy of the government of america It's uh, the, the uh, Brazilian Supreme Court justice has unilaterally banned uh, X or Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'll just say Twitter because that's this what is in my yeah. head. Come on, yeah, we're we're and, still BC people. Twitter, yeah, and had, and in, and had it wanted to impose fines of up to ten thousand dollars if you used a VPN to access Twitter where a VPN is a device that basically moves your... Uh, well, what is a VPN, Kevin? I a don't virtual know, private network uh, where you can uh, set up your identifying IP address, your telephone number in, in computer speak, as being one from America. Like when I want to watch Minnesota Vikings football, I change my VPN to a Minneapolis VPN, and I can watch a football game without being blocked out. So that's how... So, uh, <clears throat> American football... Sorry, people. Well, uh, I, th I think the the, uh, the fine has been backed down, or some some there's been some development, but it's still X has been banned. And what's interesting is the silence. Uh, here's a major American corporation. The U.S. government is either silent or openly supporting the Brazilian judge's decision. Now we've got some people on the hard left of the political spectrum, like Keith Ellis and the Attorney General, General of Minnesota, saying bravo to uh, words to that effect to Brazil for banning Twitter. We have Robert Reich, a former uh, Clinton cabinet officer, writing in The Guardian that, uh, you know, Elon Musk should be investigated and perhaps jailed. And Kamala Harris, saying, you know, didn't answer this directly, but said, you know, Sometimes you can lose your privilege uh, for free speech if you say things that aren't nice. Well, Pri privilege? not to pick on, privilege. yeah, not to pick on 
not to pick on Kamala Harris, but uh, it's a right. That free speech is not a privilege; yeah. it's a right. Um, see, here's here's the thing: we had, you know, when we were talking about the English uh, riots, um, one little bit of a obscure news, courtesy of George Conger. Uh, two journalists were sentenced to uh, prison in Hong Kong for their speech. And you can be a Hong Kong newspaper man and be opposing the Communist Party's policies in Hong Kong and be sentenced to less jail time than if you're an English working class man who says something mean to a policeman. These guys in Hong Kong only got two years in jail under the sedition laws of Hong Kong for their anti-government speech. Whereas people in England are getting longer sentences for less. So when now Hong Kong is more liberal in its speech than the UK is, we got trouble. But the problem is our government is silent. The church is silent. Without free speech, we have nothing. And in the United States, we do not have our rights given to us by the government. We have them given to us by God. One of our viewers had a comment saying that, well, this, this, you know, the argument was uh, protesting the police is akin to shouting fire in a crowded theater, and that's not good. Therefore, that's not true. their their words uh, are are could lead to mayhem and danger and violence and chaos. Well, that's that's a very faulty analogy and one I would reject because. If you take that line, any speech that somebody in authority dislikes could say, oh, well, that could cause trouble. And that's like yelling fire in a crowded theater. You know, it's in, in not, fact, there's using, not a risk of imminent death by speaking yeah. the truth or you or even being rude and boorish. Yeah, if I, Martin Luther King went down to uh, the South and protested police violence against uh, mm -hmm. uh, blacks, if you want to use that same construct that speaking uh, uh, against police action uh, is harmful and you should be arrested, then Martin Luther King and the whole civil rights movement here in America will have been shut down under those that guise of, of your understanding of what free speech is. Here in America, in the Bill of Rights, our free speech is a right, and a right is granted to us. Clearly, we understand it is from God. Uh, we have it documented in our Bill of Rights, but it is right. It's not something that is a privilege. A privilege is something you have access to uh, privileges, but a right is different. A right is uh, a guarantee. And I am guaranteed the right of free speech. Now, there, it's within uh, kind of a fireplace. I can't go into a crowded theater and yell fire. Of course, that's not free speech. Uh, and no, nobody is arguing that. But from these great... Uh, civil rights uh, uh, protests to the great uh, colleges in the 70s, like Berkeley, who were the head of um, free speech, to now turn around and say, "Yeah, but not your speech." Well, no, that's not how. That's not free. <laughs> I have the right to free speech. I have the right to be right. I have the right to be wrong. I have the right to free speech. You know. <laughs> And I mean, now this is a whole area of litigation yeah, of law where, like, well, is, isn't pornography free speech? Mm -hmm. Up to a point, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, isn't uh, well, if I yell, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him, where a guy's got a gun, well, isn't that free speech? No, it's not because you are basically right. encouraging yeah. an active situation that could lead to the death of somebody. So, I mean, there are, we're not totally absolute, but uh, I think. This basically standard was once upon a time when the ACLU actually did something rather than being a political hack. You know, they allowed the uh, American, they supported the American Nazis when they marched through the Jewish Illinois. neighborhood of Skokie, Illinois yeah. in the 70s. Now, that was a horrible thing. Why would any, any, any normal people do that? But the ACL's point was not to be pro Nazi, mm -hmm. but rather than say, well, these people, as horrible as they are, have the right to do this. And now that right has changed, you know, and it's even changed here in America because uh, Elon Musk has become the enemy of the government for allowing free speech. Now, Twitter is not completely free of speech all the time. Uh, uh, all, not all the time. 
frequently I'll see somebody posting a stupid story from uh, six or seven years ago saying this is happening today, and Twitter has a little correction on the bottom. This was originally posted in uh, 2019. It's not accurate to say it's a 2024 story. They do correct stories, uh, but they still allow you to... to they, they don't uh, ban the user for saying it, but they will correct it. Facebook will ban you for saying it, which is different. And so, you know, I, I don't mind being corrected, but I don't want to be banned. Now, one of the mentioning Facebook, Facebook has acceded to the demands of the Brazilian judge mm -hmm. and will censor things that the judge once censored. And this past week, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was on the TV saying, yes, the FBI, he worked with the FBI and the Democratic uh, National Committee to censor speech at the 2020 election that was unfavorable to Joe Biden, such as the laptop of his son, Hunter, that had all the salacious stuff on it. The FBI knew it was real. The Biden administration knew it was real. Facebook knew it was real, but they all got together and tried to throttle any news about this. Um, now, why is Mark Zuckerberg coming clean at this point? He he's not he's he has specifically said he's not endorsing any candidate, which I think means he thinks Donald Trump's going to win, and he's got to sort of start protecting himself I, from being. But I what's interesting here is the FBI. If they if the FBI didn't interfere in uh, Biden Trump and overturn that one, that's notable. But they also interfered in. Uh, uh, Trump versus what's her face, the, the, the Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Clinton, because right before two and a half weeks before she was the election, uh, they put out uh, a warrant to interview her because of the uh, hard drives, mm -hmm. and she was ahead in the polls until that time, and uh, the head of the FBI and the AG uh, said we need to have an investigation before the election on this. And I think that cost her Wisconsin and um, it cost her uh, Pennsylvania because she was ahead in the polls there. So the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation may have affected, to the, our knowledge, the last two American elections to some degree or another by overturning states that would not have overturned uh, before. Uh, now, yeah, if you're a conspiracy theorist, they've affected all the elections. I, 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 I want to go there. But I would say there's certainly evidence that they o overturned in some degree uh, Clinton, Trump, and in, to some degree Biden, uh, uh, Trump. So I don't know. That's interesting, George. Yeah. Yeah, and part of the part, what I think the strange dynamic we have right now is that the is the marriage or merger of the Kennedy group and the Trump group. Mm -hmm because a lot of them, they disagree on many things, but they're united in their revulsion with what people call the deep state, the elites, the establishment. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an interesting world we live in. Yeah. Uh, people say uh, Russian influence overturned the uh, uh, Clinton-Trump and that Russian influence overturned the uh, Biden-Trump elections. And, and yeah. To be honest, America has been involved in overturning elections in foreign countries since at least the 1920s, mid-1925s. It's not something that's just new. Uh, countries have been doing that for a long time. And, well, uh, we tried to, we tried, Thomas Jefferson tried to, uh, you know, overturn the uh, Barbary, Barbary right. uh, pirates. Yep. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, uh, ex exercising American force abroad is uh, is a long and well established practice. No. But repetition doesn't make it right. No. Right. But just interesting times as, ele as elections approaching, um, and just the role of media again uh, in trying to affect the election. Uh, you know, we've complained about it. We are media, so we you know we are probably more sensitive to it. But um, I, I really took note of this back when Clinton was running against Bush, that the role of major media in 
giving positive stories to one candidate and negative stories to another candidate. And it's, it's just, it's 10 times that now, you know, so such are the times. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episodes 878 of Anglican Unscripted.